everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it is definitely going to be a furry friend of ours because we are covering the oh so wonderful horse. This is a very, very special listener episode dedicated to Rachel and to Rachel's entire class from Louisville, Kentucky. You guys rock, and they all wanted to know more about horses because of the famed Kentucky Derby that was happening when this episode was requested. For those of you that are unfamiliar, like I was prior to the suggestion of this animal, the Kentucky Derby is an annual horse race. And from what I understand, it is a big one and it looks pretty fun. Rachel's class from Kentucky loves to listen to the podcast when they are sort of winding down, maybe from having too much fun in the classroom. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel's class. You are all going to have to give your teacher a big hug for being the coolest teacher ever to have your own podcast episode. I hope all of you enjoy it. And for those of you that want to request an animal, you can do so in three ways. You can send a message to the Instagram handle Relax with Animal Facts. You can go to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and click on the Animal Request tab. And lastly, you can always just email directly to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. All of them are great options, and I look forward to reading more of your cool suggestions. I got my facts from spca.bc.ca, thesprucepets.com, nationalgeographic.com, and of course from Etim Online for the name Horse. All of these resources are in the description or the show notes of this episode. If you want to learn more, please go to these resources because without them, this episode would not have been possible. And now I would like for all of you to notice maybe where you were carrying some tension. It might be in the head, it might be in the neck. For me, it's actually in the legs because I just started jogging again and man, am I out of shape. And I encourage all of you to try to be more like Jello and relax right alongside me as we go into this immersive experience with me, Steph Wolf, into the prairies and plains where the wild horse resides. The horse is an animal that many of us are familiar with just because of the history of horses and people going back in the annals of time. And we are just painting a very broad brush stroke across the entire horse population. There are many different kinds of horses that we can cover in future episodes. Some are very large, some are adorably small, but today we are dealing with the broad name of horse. And the scientific name of the horse is one that might sound familiar from the zebra episode. It is the Equus ferris cabalus. The horse is of course a mammal and is a herbivore as well. With how fast they run, boy am I glad that they are not carnivorous. Now that distinction, mammal, we hear it thrown around a lot, but maybe it is a bit of 
an out there concept for you and you don't know exactly what a mammal is. A mammal is a warm-blooded vertebrate animal of a class that is distinguished by the possession of hair or fur. This is always accompanied in mammals by the ability to secrete milk for young that is typically born alive. So after the live foal or the baby horse is born and they're already running around in just about 15 minutes or so, they can get their nourishment from the milk of the mother horse. So that is what makes a mammal a mammal. Now the size of the horse is going to really depend on a few things, the main one being the particular kind of horse. So the height going up to the shoulders, not including their majestic head and mane, is going to be between 30 to 69 inches. And they can weigh in between 120 to 2,200 pounds. Now that huge broad sweep of weight from 120 to over 2,000 pounds is accounted by the different kinds of horses. You have miniature horses and then you have horses like Clivesdales which are enormous. Now one of the reasons why we are so familiar with horses as we are with dogs, especially here in the West, horses and humans have an ancient relationship. They were likely domesticated by Asian nomads some 4,000 years ago, and the animals remained essential to many human societies until, of course, the advent of the modern engine. This doesn't mean that people don't ride horses anymore. It just means that the highway is probably not going to be laden with any sort of horse and carriage. But horses are always held in very high esteem all throughout our history. And this can especially be seen in the last thousand years of art in which they depict horses in these very heroic battles and even in these of course still frame paintings you can almost see the horses galloping with the saber or bayonet wielding warriors on top of them there are around 400 different breeds however that specialize in everything from pulling wagons to racing and of course the racing aspect is what stirred rachel's classroom to want to know more about these fast creatures and boy are they fast horses can run up to 60 miles per hour and even with a rider on top of their back they have reached recorded speeds of up to 55 miles per hour which is about 88 kilometers per hour for my Canadian friends. And while most horses are domestic, there are those that run wild and run free. The North American Mustang, which is a free-roaming wild horse, is the descendant of horses that were brought by the Europeans more than 400 years ago to the Americas. Now there is one horse which is the only truly wild horse who was never domesticated and that is the Pshevalsky's horse and ironically this very sturdy, stocky, big animal exists today only in captivity. The last wild Pshevalsky's horse was seen in Mongolia in 19. 68. What a legacy of being the only horse to be wild, truly wild and free for much of its history. Now we can move on to some facts about the horse that we might not know. The first one is that horses cannot breathe through their mouth. 
So you and me, we can breathe through our nose, we can breathe through our mouth, but horses can only breathe through their nose. Their anatomy restricts their breathing exclusively through their nose and their mouth exclusively for eating. Along with not being able to breathe through their mouths, they also can't burp or vomit through their mouths like humans do. The digestive system of the horse only goes one way, unlike cattle and other sorts of domesticated animals who regurgitate their food to rechew it, which is a bit gross, but they have this efficient digestive system where they can process these very tough, grassy, fibrous foods that they will be eating and grazing during their foraging. Now, how do we determine whether a horse is a miniature one, whether a horse is a big one? How do we measure them? Horses are very commonly measured in hands. The standard measurement for determining the height of the horse is called a hand. One hand is equal to about four inches, though of course that hand has to be pretty standard. It is not absolute. If you have somebody with ginormous hands, like many different basketball players for example, one hand for them might be a lot more than four inches. But for example, the always dreamed of pony is an equine that measures in under 14.2 hands. The only equines that are not measured in hands are miniature horses, which are measured rather in inches or centimeters. The measuring of horses by hands, I imagine, was a pragmatic solution to easily being able to measure horses without any needed material or tools. Similar to some other animals that we have covered just in the recent past, horses have what is called a stay apparatus. It is a system of tendons and ligaments which is going to allow the horse to lock out their joints and sleep standing up. They can also use it when they're not just sleeping. Say they are standing and just want to rest a little while. They can lock out their joints, engage their stay apparatus like a kickstand on a bike, and relax without worrying about falling over. But this will allow the horse to conserve their energy so that when it is time for a long ride or to continue a long ride, they have that much energy in store. But just because they have a stay apparatus, it does not mean that they never lay down. They do and will often do so for a deeper kind of sleep. I would imagine that if human beings were given some sort of stay apparatus, we would much rather lay down most of the time. Horses are majestic, they are beautiful creatures, but they can also be pretty dangerous if they choose to be. Horses have a lightning fast reflex to be able to kick in just 0.3 seconds. And with how fast they run, their musculature is seriously impressive, so that kick is not something you want to be on the receiving end of. Their reaction time is 0.3 seconds on average, while the average human reaction time is about 1.6 seconds. That means that the horse's reaction time is over 5 times faster than ours. Now, of course, horses will only really kick when they are threatened with some sort of danger. Domesticated horses and racing horses, as far as I understand, are much more tame. But for those of you that might ride horses, I really look forward to your emails to help me better understand what that process is like. 
One thing that makes them very cool and also, I would suppose, great listeners is that they have 10 different muscles in their ears. This will allow them to rotate nearly 180 degrees. That is turning straight from north to south and they can move their ears independently of one another. Just for context, human beings have only three muscles in their ears. So when we see a person moving their ears, we ooh and we ah, wow, how do you move your ears like that? But if they could move their ears 180 degrees, I'm pretty sure many of us would scream. The horse is turning out to be an incredibly impressive creature. Along with really muscular ears, they also have a very comprehensive field of vision. It is nearly 360 degrees, but they do have two blind spots. One directly behind them and the other just in front below their giant nose. Because they have their eyes in that very particular position on the sides of their head, they can see a lot. But because of those blind spots, it means that they can't actually see the grass that they're grazing on or the carrot that you stick out right underneath their nose. Instead, they will use their very flappy, floppy, mobile lips that are very sensitive to different stimuli, as well as their whiskers and their sense of smell, to know what is in front of them and the fact that there is a carrot right underneath their nose. All of those senses are going to be playing a role in deciding what the horse is putting into its mouth. Of course, the horse will likely see the carrot before you put it underneath its nose, but if it were to just appear there, they can consult their other senses to be able to determine, I want to eat this. Apart from being incredibly quick and unique in their anatomy, they are also highly intelligent animals. One study even showed that horses had the ability to communicate their needs to their caretakers. They would communicate if they wanted a blanket on or off by touching certain symbols on a board. They can be taught just like dogs through positive reinforcement and clicker training. This intelligence accompanied with their incredible speeds is what made them such a versatile and felicitous animal for the battlefield and for those long solitary treks in the prairies. I would think that just because an animal is really fast, that doesn't mean you would want to necessarily mount it. If you had an animal that was not intelligent at all, but could run up to 60 miles per hour, I'm not sure about you, but I do not want to be on the back of that thing. In addition to being very smart, they are also very social animals. This is a good thing because they would normally find safety in a herd and form strong social relationships with one another. As prey animals, meaning they can be subject to being preyed upon, being in large groups is a huge advantage, and if they were not social animals, this would make it a bit challenging for them. Horses have around 205 bones in their skeleton, but some Arabian horses will have fewer ribs and lumbar vertebra as well than is typically found in other breeds of horses. They will have five lumbar vertebrae rather than six and 17 pairs of ribs rather than 18. The amount of bones in a horse is actually very similar to the amount of bones in an adult person. Me and you have 206 bones in our skeletons, so the horse is just one shy of making the cut. 
And now let us go to the last fact of the episode, which is the name horse. Where does it come from and what does it mean? And sometimes etymologies are short and sweet, but for the horse, this is not the case. Because the etymology of this animal is very long and well documented, I am going to skip around to some important bits for us to get the most out of it. So the Old English horse, which is just H-O-R-S without the E, came from the Proto-Germanic word harse. It goes back to Norse words, Old Frisian words, Saxon words, Middle Dutch, Dutch, Old High German, and it all goes back to some of unknown origin. But some say it is connected to the root word cares, which is spelled K-E-R-S, which means to run, the source of the Latin word career, which is to run as well. Some prefer the theory as to why we are using the word horse is because it is a loan word from an Iranian language known as Sarmatian and was also borrowed into Uralic. So there is some dispute as to the etymological origin of the word horse, but regardless, there is some rich history here. And the word horse was used at least since the 14th century of various appliances and devices which would suggest a horse, such as the sawhorse. And it's typically in reference to something that is being mounted upon or something upon which something is mounted. We of course know words like horseradish, horse latitudes, horse pistol, which was a large one-handed pistol used by horseback riders. Of course, that makes sense. Now, you might have even heard the expression, don't beat a dead horse, and that comes from the 1630s version, to flog a dead horse. All it really means is that you are attempting to revive interest in a topic that is worn out and nobody wants to talk about anymore. I have heard it in day-to-day -day conversation, but it is on the rarer side. There are also things like the horse's mouth, meaning you heard it from the horse's mouth. So we see just how much the horse has had an impact on day-to-day -day society throughout history. We are now going to move on to the review portion of the show where I read a review from one of you special listeners out there. But today I am actually going to read two. One of them is a five-star review and another one is a two-star review and you will see why I am going to do so in just a moment. But we are going to start with the five-star review coming from LPATND, who is writing from the United States of America, and LPATND writes, I'm loving the show. Your voice is always so soothing. And then there are a plethora of emojis. I'm from the United States. Can you please do an episode on the sawfish? Thank you, LP, for that wonderful review of yours, and I can absolutely do an episode on the sawfish that will definitely go on the list, and I will be sure to give you a big shout-out on your future episode. I am also so glad that you enjoy the show as much as you do. Now, the second review is coming from the United States of America as well. Now, I cherish every bit of feedback and review, but the only reason I wouldn't include this review in a single episode is because there is not much that I can do about it. This is written by Michael Jackson's He He via Apple Podcasts. This user writes, his voice is the incarnation 
of sadness. Now, this is not the only pointed review about my voice. There have been a good amount of them, and that is totally okay. I always encourage even people that don't like the podcast to write a review so we can make it better. The only problem is that I only have one voice. But I can assure the user who wrote this review, along with all of you out there listening, although my voice might be an incarnation of sadness to some, I do have a tremendous amount of joy. And this podcast is just something that adds to it all the more. So I will continue to read reviews that are not so great and some that are witty and pointed at my expense. I don't much mind. But the reviews that are exclusively about, say, my voice or about the fact that I am a Canadian, those are things that I can't really help. And while I still encourage the writing of them, I probably will not read them on the show. Thank you all for listening to this podcast episode. What an exciting, unique, and wonderful episode this was, especially because it is for a whole classroom, along with Rachel as the instructor that is now the coolest teacher in school. If you want to learn about an animal that you find cool and interesting, you can send a message to Relax with Animal Facts on Instagram. Click on the Animal Request tab on relaxwithanimalfacts.com or you can send an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. I look forward to seeing your animal requests. You can feel free to also include maybe a funny story with animals that you've had in the past. Maybe why you like the show, how you found the show, really anything. I just always look forward to corresponding with all of you listeners out there. You are what make the show possible. And so I always get giddy whenever my emails or my Instagram messages get full. Thank you all for listening to this podcast episode. I hope you will join me for the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.